Kitco Mining special coverage of the Mining Investment Event of the North is brought to you by EMX Royalty Corp. Mark Selvi is a leading expert in a metal that is turned from sleepy to front and center, and that's nickel. Uh, Mark Selby is a CEO of Canada Nickel. Mark, welcome back to Kitco. Great to be here today. Great to see you in person as well, too. Yes, better than little, little boxes on a screen, so. <laughs> Tell us about nickel, where are we in terms of supply? Yeah, so the, the last uh, three or four months have been very exciting. Uh, back in early March, the LME actually halted trading uh, in the nickel market. You had a, one person who had a very large short position, a bunch of other people started piling in on the other side. That combined with very, very low inventories, we're almost back to the record low inventories uh, that we had during the big nickel, nickel run back in 2005, 6, 7, when nickel got to $24 a pound. Um, and as a result of those imbalances, the LME ceased trading for, for about a week. Um, it took them a while to get it going. Um, and again, there's been a series of lawsuits launched because they not only halted trading, they actually canceled a bunch of trades that had actually occurred. So, um, you know, nickel's embroiled in, in a bit of controversy around that. Uh, but the good thing from an investor perspective is, you know, nickel prices prior to that, you know, sort of run up, uh, were trading, you know, below $10 a pound. And, you know, and, and now, to, you know, they've been trading in a range anywhere from 11 to $13 a pound, which, you know, for us with our project, we use the $7.75 long-term price uh, for the project. And so with nickel prices at today, that's, you know, hugely supportive uh, for our story going forward. What's the latest in terms of the long-term demand right now uh, for nickel? Well, the key thing is yeah, I was just over in uh, Korea a few weeks ago meeting with a bunch of the battery precursor and, and battery makers who are the ones who are going to be using the nickel uh, to, to build the batteries for the electric vehicles. Yeah. Uh, and I can tell you, I mean, the thing that I don't think the market really appreciates is just the scale of the amount of nickel um, that's going to be required, uh, you know, for the EV market by the end of this decade. You know, we're we're talking, you know, with the volumes that you know are on the table with some of these groups. You know, we're going to need uh, two to three to four x uh, the amount of nickel uh, that's currently produced in North America, which is about 150,000 tons. You know, we're seriously looking at somewhere between you know anywhere from 300 to 600,000 tons of nickel annually, um, you know, by the end of this decade. And there's very little visibility on projects, you know, that could, could meet that time frame. I want to get into your projects in a minute, but uh, maybe just uh, keep us out for a little bit further sure. as well, yeah. too. Uh, nickel, do you require exacting chemistries, like when you're doing, uh, say, for like a lithium or like a graphite, for instance? Yeah, so in terms of, you know, the thing here is there's uh, the market's going to evolve. You know, historically, uh, you had laterite projects, you know, yeah. that sent through to a ferronickel, uh, and then you had uh, sulfide projects. You know, miners sold concentrate to the smelters or refiners who turned it into an end product. Because you've got this huge new source of demand coming from the EV sector, um, what you're seeing is a whole a whole new set of intermediaries emerge who can take intermediates from laterites, who can take concentrates from sulfides. Um, and then turn them into the various chemicals and products um, that the market needs. So the good thing is, from a miner, from a miner's perspective, you know we don't think you need to go all the way downstream. Um, you know they'll, you'll be able to capture the bulk of the value because that intermediate part, which was effectively an oligopoly before, but yeah. between the historical nickel smelters, is now rapidly breaking down, and you're going to have lots of options to sell your product and sell it at a much higher price than you could say, you know, even five years ago. Well, there has been some interesting companies that have gone downstream. So I think yeah. it's Gevrois Global and stuff like that, yes. uh, where they've suddenly pivoted and they're buying refineries. And then yeah. also Sabani Stillwater as well, too. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think Gervois, I, I think, you know, in the cobalt space, I think yeah. that was that was was a good move. Um, mm -hmm. You know, uh, their mine in Idaho, um, you know, again, they were kind of trapped to some of the existing smelters. Um, who were some of the only places they could place that concentrate. So, you know, by having an alternative to kind of bypass them entirely, you know, mm -hmm. just gives them so much more leverage uh, in terms of how they take product to market. And again, you know, they, they were able to take existing facilities. The one in Brazil had been sitting mothballed, you know, produced for a very long time. So again, in today's market where, you know, you, you're, we, we know the demand for cobalt is going to grow, the demand for nickel is going to grow. So to be able to take processing facilities, pick them up for pennies on the dollar, um, and then repurpose them. You know, I thought those were both brilliant moves by uh, by Bryce yeah. and Co. at uh, Gervois. So. I think the, the way they explain it as well is yeah. because, you know, there's such a ramp up in demand right now that they're anticipating around battery metals. There's going to be bottlenecks throughout. So there's going to be opportunity margin, never mind actually controlling your own supply. No, no, exactly. You know, as much as we need 
you know, more metal units from the mines. We, we need, again, I think this is the thing the market doesn't appreciate, we need new processing units built in North America and Europe. You know, car makers don't want their nickel or cobalt to start in a mine in North America, have to travel to Asia to get processed and come back again. So, you know, that's exactly, you know, the opportunity that was there and, and uh, Gervois did a great job seizing it. Well, you touched on as well, too. The other thing that's coming out is this, is that the automakers, the people who are actually going to be uh, the end consumers of these metals, they're just demanding scale. They're demanding it that you wouldn't see like in a precious metal supplier. Yeah, no, I, I mean, the, the uh, you know, one of the key moments for me on the trip you know, through Korea was we've got a chart where we show we're the fifth largest nickel sulfide producer globally, you know, and the yeah. first question out of their mouth was, you know, can you make it bigger, you know, and how quickly can you make it bigger? Um, you know, generally, uh, past life, you know, with another project, it was always around, can you start smaller? Can you get the CapEx smaller? You know, all of these car companies, all of these battery supply chain people, you know, they need large volumes of nickel and they need it far sooner than I think the market, you know, really realizes. Bring us up to date. Where are you with Canada Nickel? Yeah, so Crawford, uh, we'll have a resource update out here in a few weeks. Uh, that's feeding into a feasibility study that's on track uh, for the end of the year. Uh, you know, one thing that happened at the end of last year, and I think we talked in, during our last discussion, was you know we assembled a whole uh, set of properties around Timmins. You know that we think there's another half dozen or more Crawfords uh, in the Timmins region. We picked up two uh, just a few weeks ago with uh, a, pro a project uh, Bannockburn from Grid Metals, where they've already partly drilled it off, uh, and then another uh, piece of property, New Market, which abuts uh, two other targets that we already have and, and the structure that we like continues right onto that property. So uh, again, you know, Crawford itself, largest sulfide discovery since the 70s. You know, we filed the permitting documents in April as well. So we're, you know, on track, we'd like to start construction on that, you know, by 2025 uh, at the latest. And, and again, we think we'll be, you know, creating a whole pipeline of very large nickel opportunities, which is exactly what, uh, you know, our, the Asian EV suppliers and the North American automakers are looking for. How's the infrastructure in the area? That's one of the key, key strengths for the project. Uh, you know, we're not in a remote location. We're going to have to depend on the government to build a road to get there. You know, uh, we're literally adjacent to a highway. We've got power lines that come from hydroelectric generating stations just to the north. Uh, we have a rail line that can be extended 10 kilometers right up, uh, right up to the plant site. And the other properties that we have as well, too, are, you know, close to the Trans-Canada Highway, close to uh, a bunch of the uh, railways nearby. So, Again, we're very, very well endowed by uh, infrastructure in this region, which again, will make it, making great big large scale operations that much more capital efficient. Uh, what is it like uh, building, a, uh, building a nickel operation right now? What is the hurdle for doing something like that? Yes, the key thing for us right now, I mean, we're, we're confident on the resource, we're confident on, on where the feasibility study is gonna land. You know, the real challenge for us, and again, the challenge for the industry, you know, they can get, uh, they can retool an auto plant and, you know, get that permitting done very quickly. If they wanna build a battery plant, they can get that permitting done very quickly. You know, right now with, with the mining industry, you know, we're budgeting three years for the federal process and two years for the provincial process. You know, we're hoping, uh, given that our project, other than the fact that we're digging a very large hole in the ground, you know, and are going to have very large tailings and waste rock facilities, the other characteristics of the project, you know, it, it's been an area that's been logged before multiple times. There's no protected flora fauna. That our tailings and waste rock are non-deleterious. They're the same geochemical uh, qualities as dirt. Uh, so, you know, we think, you know, we, we can move through the permitting process very quickly without any major hurdles. And we, you know, we want to work with our partners to see if there's any way to, to be able to shorten those timelines and get more metal to the market faster. Uh, tell us about the environmental aspect as well, too, because uh, nickel has been or in places is it is a place that can uh, be, um, how would you say, energy intensive and slightly dirty for producing. Yeah, that's uh, you know, one, one of the other key strengths of this project is the fact that we're hosted in rock. Um, that has uh, this great property that when it's, spont when it's exposed to air, it spontaneously absorbs CO2 uh, and turns itself into to another mineral, which is equally uh, inert. So um, one of the big advantages of being in a place like Ontario uh, with access to low carbon electricity from the grid, you know, something that we, we in Canada, I think, take for granted. There aren't that many jurisdictions around the world where that is actually the case. And, you know, Ontario, Quebec, BC, uh, you know, are, are some of those jurisdictions. Um, we can design a low carbon operation from the start. And with the carbon that's absorbed by our tailings and waste rock, we think we can get to a zero carbon level, level and actually have carbon credits available for sale. Uh, lastly, Mark, uh, catalyst over the next 12 months. Yeah, so uh, again, we've been moving this project very quickly. Uh, mm -hmm. Over the last two and a half years or so, the company's been around. Uh, we'll have a resource update out here in a few weeks. 
Uh, we'll have the feasibility study out uh, by the end of Q4. Uh, you'll see a series of drilling results as we start to step around uh, those regional properties. Uh, we're working quite closely with the uh, local First Nations groups to get impact benefit agreements in place you know, in time uh, with the feasibility study. So yeah, no, it's gonna be a jam-packed year this year. Mark, thanks very much for telling us a story. Thank you. My name is Michael McRae. We're here at the Mining Investment Event here in Quebec City. Kitco Mining Special Coverage of the Mining Investment Event of the North is brought to you by EMX Royalty Corp.